Thank you, Professor Chen. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to be here at the home of the frog bear and the Tianju and all the things that are happening in Buddhist studies in Canada. It's, a, it's really a fantastic place they've got going here. So I'm, I'm very uh, happy to be invited. Uh, I'm also honored to give a talk for the first time on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Musqueam people. It means a lot to me to acknowledge that and to be here. Uh, so, before I really start with my lecture, I want to give you a bit of a historical kind of window into this period that I work on because it's often kind of overlooked in studies of Buddhism, I think. So I'm going to talk about an area that spans uh, probably the 4th to 6th centuries, more or less, and that's a period that I work on. And uh, it's worth pointing out before I start talking that this time in China is a time of, of major textual uh, involvement. So what's going on in the textual world? There's lots of Buddhist texts being translated, of course we all know that. Uh, what I'm going to try to talk about is what happens beyond translation. What happens uh, when we want to choose which texts are being translated, how are texts translated, and the different kinds of social actors involved in that uh, that venture that we often just talk about as translation. Uh, and when I'm doing that, I'm doing it for the purpose of trying to show that women were involved in this textual proliferation from the 4th to 6th centuries in ways that we might not acknowledge uh, because they're not translators, they're not authors. Um, but they're very much involved in the process of textual production in this time period from the 4th to 6th centuries. Uh, and um, Part of my work, I, this is not a research project in and of itself, this talk I'm going to give today. Uh, this talk came from a couple different research projects that I have ongoing in which I've just noticed uh, the presence of women as textual producers and textual innovators in a number of different ways. And so I kind of wanted to put all that together into a talk uh, when, when Jinhua invited me. So. We're going to start, um, well, we'll start at the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> I'm sorry for the, the cheesy iceberg metaphor on the Prezi format, but I think it actually really works in this particular case, so I just stuck with it. So let's go to uh, the one and only woman who we all know uh, used text. All right, when we talk about Empress Wu, and uh, again, this is a little bit later than my period, right? I'm working in the 4th to 6th centuries, and she's, of course, in the 7th century. And uh, what we know about her is that she used Buddhist text in a number of different ways. Most famously, of course, she had the, the commissioning of the commentary to the Great Cloud Sutra, which positioned her as a bodhisattva, it positioned her as the rightful ruler of China. So she used um, Buddhist text to help legitimate the, the imperial power that she held. She also trans er, um, transmitted Buddhist text around her empire. She wrote commentaries herself, so she did a lot of work um, in Buddhist textual worlds, I think. And she's like the one standout example that we all have, I think, when you think about uh, women with sort of powerful positions in medieval China and uh, women using Buddhist texts and using Buddhist teachings in medieval China. Uh, she's the one that we all go to, right? She's the most famous. She, she ruled China in her own name, the only person to ever do that. Uh, and she did it largely through Buddhism. So this is a, a very enigmatic person. And this is a great example of what I'm sort of talking about by textual production is that she was not a translator of this textual material, but she certainly uh, helped to define which texts would be translated and which texts would be circulated and under which kinds of auspices. Now, what I, I'm just using her as the tip of the iceberg, though, and, and really the tip. My period is, is, low, is lower in the iceberg, is earlier in, in history, uh, the 4th to 6th centuries. And I see uh, Wu Zetian not as the start of a tradition of women who used text and women who ruled and women who had political influence. I see her as an inheritor of a tradition that had started uh, far before her time, well, a couple hundred years before her time. And that she's, although what she did is uh, unprecedented and she was certainly a trailblazer, I very much think that she was relying on things that other women had did before her. And so we're going to look at a few of the ways in which we can maybe see that. So I just begin with her because everybody knows who she is and uh, we all know kind of what we're talking about here. And so I kind of want to fill in a bit of a backstory before her that suggests that women have been involved in textual worlds before her and that she's an inheritor of this kind of tradition. Okay. All right, so that's all we're going to talk about in Bruce <laughs> She's She's done. So um, in approaching this topic, I'm going to talk actually about two different sutras uh, that I have been working on for different projects of mine. Uh, and in looking at these two different sutras, I've been able to 
uh, well, find out and discover that both of them, I think, are related to uh, female audiences and female textual production. So that's how I'm going to organize most of my talk, is around first the, um, the Sutra on Transforming the Female Form. I think I have a, yeah. Uh, and then the Srimala Sutra. And then we'll kind of pause and talk about what I mean as women of te as textual producers. And then we'll jump over an iceberg and try to answer the, the questions of whether or not that matters. Does it matter to see women in these roles historically? And, and how does it matter? Okay. So let's start with the Sutra on Transforming the Female Form, uh, which, um, which Professor Chen mentioned. I have a project on sexual transformation, and this is kind of a cornerstone sutra of that project. It's one of many, but it's a kind of a cornerstone one. So let's hop in there for a sec. Okay. So it's a complicated text, uh, the Sutra on Transforming the Female Form. It purports to have been translated by a monk called Dharma Mitra uh, in the Liu Song. And we're going to talk quite a bit about the Liu Song court. And if you know my other work, I, am, I mostly work on the Northern Way. So jumping into the South is a bit of a transition for me, but I'll definitely find a way to get us into the Northern Way in a couple of slides. <laughs> so hold on, we'll still talk about the Northern Way. Uh, but the, the court of the Liu Song was very active in Buddhist textual production in this period, unlike the courts of the Northern Way. Uh, we're not huge textual producers. So looking at textual production, we kind of have to look uh, at this particular court. So the text was said to have been translated by Dharmamitra in this time, and it's a, it's a master text about why a woman would like to, to do sexual transformation, why, why it's beneficial for a woman to change her body into a male body along the path to Buddhahood, is sort of the, the implied understanding of it. But let me tell you about the text itself before... I'm going to use the text to talk about its audience and talk about its patronage, but it's important, I think, to understand first what the text is actually about. Uh, because it's pretty spectacular, really. Okay, so what we have with this text is what I call a pastiche. Uh, we have two different textual trend traditions, two different sutra stories, uh, woven together into this text with some creative new stuff added in, uh, basically. So the, the first set of stories we have is um, the baby in the womb kind of setup. So if you've ever read these kinds of sutras, this what happens essentially is that the Buddha is preaching uh, to an assembly, and he notices that there's a woman in the audience pregnant, and he can see into the womb of the, the woman in question, and he sees that her child is perfect and peerless. Uh, and then the baby starts talking to the Buddha from the womb, and they have this kind of back and forth uh, before the baby is then born out of the side of her mother, just like the birth of a Buddha. And the earth shakes and quakes in six different ways, just as it does at the birth of a Buddha. And so we are signaled in the text that this is a very special child. So in the first uh, sets of stories, uh, the special child talks a little bit with the Buddha about her female body, where she came from, what Buddha land she came from, why she's here, uh, and where she's going to go after that. So that's one textual tradition, that there are a number of sutras uh, related to that story, uh, but that's one story, and that's how the Sutra on Transforming the Female Form opens, uh, with that setup. Then there's another set of stories that... Ha that oops. I don't know how to use this. Another set of stories that feature uh, a female protagonist who's not born out of the side of her mother. Um, usually she's a princess or a queen. There are different renditions of this. Uh, who has come into this Buddha land. She's come to the Buddha's assembly. And she has a lot of questions. <laughs> and these are like question and answer texts. So this is a genre uh, of Mahayana materials, these kinds of question and answer texts. And she has a lot of questions about the female body. So she pushes not only the Buddha's disciples, she argues them into logical conundrums about their kinds of chauvinisms over the female body. And then she eventually has audience with the Buddha himself, who uh, enumerates this long list of reasons why she needs to transform her female body. Uh, she's convinced in the text, and in both, both textual traditions, the protagonist undertakes this miraculous sex change, uh, and is sometimes known as a bodhisattva after they do that. So sometimes the bodhisattva who changes her sex, or sometimes this bodhisattva called pure light. Uh, so there's like a, after the sex change has taken place, usually they, they have a sort of status change. So we have these two textual traditions brought into this one sutra. So the sutra starts born out of the side, but then the question and answer, the Q&A, is taken from a different set of texts. And then the sexual transformation happens. Okay, so I call this text a pastiche. Uh, and I think it's kind of a master text on the topic. There are lots of, there's tons of texts on these topics. And this one's a bit late. The Sutra on Transforming the Female Form is a bit later uh, than some of the other ones. And it clearly stitches these things together. Um, okay, 
So I'm just going to show you a complicated slide. You don't really need to know any of this stuff, but this is just to show uh, how, how many texts are related to this one text, I guess. So you have T564, which is the sutron transforming the female form uh, with its title number. And then the, the two stories of the child in the womb, the, the, the extant translations are 562 and 3. And then these ones, the extant translations are 565 and 566. But in medieval catalogs are known under a lot of different names, uh, many of them no longer extant. So we can see that these texts all um, were popular. They were known in different places under different names, and, and we only have uh, these ones sort of left. Um, okay, so, <coughs> so they're all related. There's tons of texts. I like to show this slide just to drive home uh, how many texts we're talking about. But this is just the textual clusters around one uh, Taisho text that we can point to. Okay. All right, so let's get to the meat of it because this is the fun part, really. So when I was uh, sort of going through why this, or what was new in this text, trying to look at the pastiche nature of the text, find out what matches old uh, text and what doesn't and what's new, what's strikingly new in this text is that the Buddha offers a different explanation for why to become a man. So in normal texts, uh, well, in past texts, the explanation is largely physical. You know, the, the woman's body is inherently impure according to the logic of a Buddhist textual material because of childbirth and menstruation and things of that sort. And so uh, she needs to change it. It's simply that the, the, the female body is karmically inferior right, on a physical level. This text, however, says something different. And I'm going to read you what the Buddha says because I think it's pretty spectacular in, in uh, well, this is my translation. This is not what the Buddha said, but <laughs> this is what the Buddha is supposed to say in my translation. So when asked specifically why, after he's given all of the kind of physical reasons, he's already done all those arguments, then the protagonist is not satisfied and asks again. And he says this. He says, the female body is like that of a maidservant and cannot obtain self-sovereignty. And this is a common, um, common motif in these texts, the ability to not be sovereign or be sovereign over your own body. Uh, she's constantly troubled by sons, daughters, clothing, food, and drink, and other necessities related to family matters. And he also says that the legal system or the Dharma system for women does not allow a woman to have her own freedom. She must constantly be at the side of someone else, receiving food, drinking, clo drink, clothing, perfumes, all types of adornments, elephant and horse carts. Uh, so she gets a lot of stuff, but this is, uh, I think, a shout out to the objectification of women or the sort of special treatment of, of women. Uh, this is why she must give rise to the thought of abhorring and getting rid of her female body. And he also says this, um, the body of a woman is used by others and cannot achieve self-sovereignty. Self her labors are many, pounding herbs, milling rice, sometimes frying, sometimes grinding, big and small beans and barley, pulling wool for weaving and spinning piles of it. These many types of suffering are immeasurable. So that's what the Buddha says. Uh, and to me, so what, what the Buddha essentially does in this text, this kind of master text on the topic, is take the discussion out of physical sex and make it about social gender, which is a big step. Uh, and I think if I were a woman in 5th century China reading this textual material, an explanation uh, that focused on the fact that my social gender doesn't allow me to be free it might be a bit more convincing. So that's where I sort of, I mean, that's maybe a bit of a logical stretch, but that's where I started to try to think about who the audience of this text would be. Is it possible that the audience for this text were women who were looking for um, a new explanation, one that they thought was more, uh, one that fit them a little bit better? So if we think about who the, the message might be for, we can make a pretty evident historical connection. Elite women. So what he also says is that, and this is really unique to this text, even being a princess is terrible, basically. So he makes this, this really purposeful shout out to court women, and he says, as for a woman who's born inside the imperial palace, she necessarily belongs to another person. Throughout her life, she's like a maidservant who must serve and follow a great family, also like a disciple who must venerate and serve his master. She's beaten by different kinds of swords and staves, rocks and tiles, is defiled by every evil word. These kinds of sufferings deprive her of her self-sovereignty. This is why a woman must give rise to the thought of abhorring and getting rid of her female body. So he, after he's like wrapped up the whole argument in this text, he gives one final um, 
explanation directed particularly to women of the court. And so who are these women? If you're a woman listening to this text, who are you? And we can make a kind of uh, clear historical connection, I think. This image is not from, from my time period. This is a Tang Dynasty um, image of a nun from Baoshan uh, that Wendy Adamek works on. I just put it there as a picture of an early nun. What we know about monasticism for women in East Asia is essentially what we know about the court of the Liu Song. So this text was supposed to have been translated, but it wasn't translated. It was written anew, perhaps at this time period. And the history of monasticism, monasticism for women in China starts with the court of the Liu Song. So we've, we have women in China being ordained before this time, uh, but their ordinations are not official ordinations in that they are not um, legally done. So there's not a full uh, vinaya to, there's not a full legal code to ordain women in uh, before this, this uh, time period. Uh, and most importantly, there's not a quorum of nuns to ordain the new nuns, right? So you need a, a group of nuns to ordain new nuns, and of course there were no nuns uh, in China. So, according to the, the historical sources that we have, it was with the patronage of the Liu Song that the, the Dharma Guptaka Vinaya was finally translated, and that was a, the full lineage under which these women were translated. Uh, and it's also with the patronage of the court that women were apparently brought to, from Sri Lanka to China to ordain nuns. So we hear those stories in the biographies of the nuns, that text, the biographies of the nuns. Uh, and it tells us about some of these early nuns who were very forceful in arguing uh, to have these conditions met for them to be ordained. And so if we if we are to trust that story, these women could read Vinaya, they knew uh, that, they, that the Vinaya they had was not one that they could be ordained in, and they pressured uh, people in power to make it happen for them. And it happened for the first time in 432, I, I think, 432 of the Common Era, and, um, and previous nuns who had been unofficially ordained were reordained, and we get the sort of start of official legal ordination for women at the very time. So my kind of conjecture here is that we have an audience of women who ha have power and influence, enough power and influence that they are able to push for the patronage of their own ordination. So that's not insignificant. And we have a court that's also sponsoring translators who are translating materials related to women's lives. And that probably spoke to women. So I think here we can start to make one connection uh, that maybe we can imagine a female audience behind this text, and maybe we can even know something about who that audience is, right? Okay, and it's worth mentioning also that the later history of this text, if we jump over uh, to some of its patronage, uh, the later history of this text also has a, a relationship to a female audience. So uh, this image is, um, I think, a really it's a really unclear image, but <laughs> let me tell you that it is a rubbing of a woodblock print that was put in a book and then taken a picture from a cell phone and then sent to me and then put in my Prezi. So you can forgive just how blurry and, and not so, so clear it is. But this is a woodblock frontispiece to the colophon of the Sutran Transforming the Female Form that was printed in the Western Xia or the Xixia in the 11th century. Uh, and was commissioned by an empress dowager of that dynasty, a Buddhist empress dowager of that dynasty. And the colophon says that it was to be circulated in 93,000 copies. So that's a lot of copies. <laughs> and here we have an elite woman, uh, about 600 years later, still interested in this text, still wanting this text to be the one that is circulating around her empire, uh, or the empire that she is an empress dowager of. And I think it's from this printing run, perhaps, that the text also ends up in Japan, uh, where Laurie Meeks's work has shown that the text is popular as late as the 14th century. It's used in the funerals of elite women. Bernard Faure has worked on that uh, and uh, been um, handed down uh, to women throughout different monastic lineages in Japan as well. And uh, the, the, stone the stone scriptures at Fengshan in China also retain this text. And what's interesting about that is that they have it actually in, um, in a, a genre. Uh, you know, the, the question of how these texts get put into the canon and how they get cataloged and, uh, is a hard question. But when we look at Fengshan, we can see that there's a whole bunch of texts about the women's body that are all grouped together. 
And so there was some kind of understanding uh, that these texts worked together at this early time. So I think that we have a, we can start chipping away uh, at some of the historical narrative and show that perhaps this text was, its origin uh, was related to women of the Liosong and that its transmission was also something that women were interested in. So that's one of the places where I see uh, women in this kind of history that I'm, I'm talking about. Okay, so I think that, yeah, we're going to move on from the sutra on transforming the female form, which I'm happy to answer questions about in Q&A. If anybody uh, has questions, I've worked a lot on the text. It's, it's pretty spectacular, actually. Okay, so the next text that I kind of want to make another example of is the Srimala Sutra, or otherwise known as the uh, Sutra of Queen Srimala of the Lion's Roar. And so, uh, if probably most of you know, uh, but that sutra features Queen Srimala, who is the daughter of King Prasenajit, this um, important Indian Buddhist king. Uh, and the whole, the kind of point, or the takeaway point of the sutra, I think, is that she's a queen. So again, we have this elite female audience, she's a queen, and she is the most uh, advanced teacher of the Buddha's law. She teaches the Buddha's law better than anyone. Uh, she's the, the um, epithet of having the lion's roar is an epithet of the Buddha. So she's, she teaches with the force of the Buddha. So she's a strong, strong female protagonist. So in the, the kind of prefab map, <laughs> this text probably is a translation. It's probably um, coming out of India or Central Asia. And it's, pro it's being translated again at the Liu Song. So with the patronage of the Liu Song and the Liu Song's translators, uh, that's where it becomes translated into Chinese. Um, I'm going to talk about this little last, the, the one that's in blue here. <laughs> I'm going to talk about its transmission up into the north of China uh, from the south. So it's probably translated in the Liu Song, but um, our earliest dated reference comes from the north. So I'm going to talk about that for a second. And then, uh, as many of you probably know, it becomes a very important text in Japan, uh, for very foundational for the, the early uh, strata of Japanese Buddhism, also related to court women, right? With the court of Suiko and Shotoku, this is a big text, right? So um, that's where I'm going to try to fill in a bit of a lineage. And I don't have much to go on, but there's a bit. OK. So if we go to our earliest dated re Chinese reference of the text, outside of the text saying that it's uh, translated in the Liu Song, if we go to this first dated reference, we see a, a rare a tomb inscription of a nun whose name was Sangju, and she was the superintendent of the nuns in the Northern Wei, when the Northern Wei court was in Luoyang. So there's a Northern dynasty who moves its capital to the south, to Luoyang, and so she is the superintendent of the Bhikshunis. So what is that? Her job, essentially, as far as I understand it, is to kind of govern the female monastic community of her time, to work inside, literally in the palace, uh, and to take the palace's policies on Buddhism and Buddhist governance and administer that to the monastic world. She also, the tomb inscription tells us, she also was in charge of um, of the harem, of all of the women of the harem, making sure that they all got along. <laughs> I think, which is, you have to be a pretty impartial woman, I think, to make sure that that works. Uh, anyways, she is the only uh, woman that I have seen to have, oh, thanks, to have held this title in her life. There's another woman who died um, in 518. This is, sorry, this is dated 516. There's another woman who died in 518 who held that title of the superintendent of the bhikshunis, uh, but appears to be posthumous. So she was kind of the head nun of the Northern Way. Uh, so a big, big position. So this is the, the rubbing of the inscription that would have uh, been on her tomb. And what we are told about Sangju is that she was a very eminent nun and that she was called to the Northern Way court because she had mastered the, um, the study and chanting of various sutra materials. So she, her fame came from her ability to chant these sutras, and it was her fame, according to the biography anyways, that brought her to court. And I should mention that she's not somebody of the imperial family. We have no reason to put her at court other than this fame. So, you know, if she were related by blood or by marriage to somebody in the imperial line, we might think, okay, maybe they just brought her there because they wanted her there and they kind of fabricated this stuff. But uh, she's born uh, under the Northern Liang, so in kind of northwest China. She doesn't have 
a name. We don't know her, her name. Sungja is her Dharma name. We don't know the year that she was born. So we know nothing about her early life that would lead us to believe that she was kind of an eminent uh, woman in society until she comes to the court. Okay, so right here, it talks about her, uh, her ability to chant sutras. And it lists three sutras. It lists the, uh, the Nirvana, the Lotus, and the Srimala sutras there. Now, to, to cite the Nirvana and the Lotus at this time, not rare. Right? These things are everywhere, even at this early time. These are two very popular texts. The Srimala, though, is really outstanding. It's uh, extraordinary early, extraordinarily early for a mention of this text at this time period. Uh, and as far as I've seen, it's the earliest dated mention in epigraphy. Uh, the next dated mentions, I think, are from the Northern Ti, uh, from the caves at Xiangtanshan. So that's, that's significantly later than this, maybe 60, 70 years later, or a bit more. Uh, so this is the earliest mention of this particular text, and it's in her biography, This Woman Who Worked in the North, which is odd because the text was translated in the South not that much before this date, right? Okay, so who was she? Let's talk about who she was for a second, and uh, we can kind of connect some dots, I think. She has a fantastic story. <laughs> so basically, again, we don't know the year that she was actually born, but we can assume a few things based on the year of her death, uh, which we definitely know because it's dated on the tomb inscription, uh, and what it says about her life, and also we know something about her brother. We know her brother's birth, so we can kind of say maybe this is about the right time. So maybe she was born around 441, and she was supposed to have been ordained uh, when she was 18, so around 4, 4, 458 or 9, somewhere in there. And that's all we know. Then we don't know anything really about her for 20 years of her life until she's brought to court service by Empress Dowager Wenming. So this one Empress Dowager of the Northern Wei who is, um, uh, rules the Northern Wei very much through uh, a succession of child emperors when the Northern Wei is in the north, when its capital is in Datong. So she's, she brings her to court. And the biography tells us she brings her to court because of her fame as a Buddhist teacher and chanter, and that Empress Dowager Wenming actually sends the mail cart out to get her <laughs> and bring her to court and give her these positions. And when she's at court, she seems to uh, have been given a lot of responsibility early on. Um, I think perhaps uh, she was brought to court to help uh, take care of the young royals <laughs> to help in their education. The, this time period under Wenming is a, it's a difficult time for the Northern Wei court. There's a lot of uh, struggle and succession and things like that just before her time and I think that there's need to make sure the court is like a, a safe space for the child emperors to come. So I think that that's why she's brought there though that's just something I think is and there's no reason to assume that. But Around the year 500, she's given this title, Superintendent of the Nuns, um, which is the, the highest title that she holds until she dies. Uh, and then in 515, after Wen Ming has passed away, uh, after uh, we've, we've had a change of court, we've gone from north to south, a change of emperor, uh, she then has her own niece appointed to court. So she uses her power and influence as the Superintendent of the Nuns to bring somebody from her family uh, to court. And the reason she was able to do that, and I think this is remarkable, is that the biography tells us that she was the private teacher of Emperor Xuanwu. So this is a woman who was trusted to be in private audience with the emperor, teaching him Buddhism, <laughs> essentially. And he was known as a, as a patron of the Buddhist tradition. So she has her, her niece appointed to court. Her niece eventually becomes the consort of Emperor Xuanwu and births a son by him. After Xuan was death, uh, there's a bit of a fight between his official empress and this woman who would become Empress Dowager Ling, uh, resulting in the death of the official empress. <laughs> First, her banishment to the nunnery, which is a question we can talk about. She gets banished to the nunnery by Empress Dowager Ling, and then she's also uh, murdered there. Um, and then Empress Dowager Ling takes over uh, as, as, uh, as Empress Dowager behind her own son. Uh, and one of the things about Empress Dowager Ling, that the book that um, came out of my dissertation that Professor Chen referenced is a study of Empress Dowager Ling and her, her Buddhism and the ways in which she used Buddhism to legitimate her political power and the way in which the Buddhist institution helped to establish her political power. Uh, so I've written quite a bit about her and I, I don't want to dive into her too much, but it's worth mentioning that she's another example of a woman engaged in textual production. Uh, I mentioned before that the Northern Way is not not very well known for textual production. There's some, a few cornerstone texts translated under the Northern Way, 
but not that many. Uh, and much of the textual activity that happened, happened under her reign. So when the court moves to south, to Luoyang, uh, there's this big Buddhist monastery called the Yongning. And in the Yongning, we have a bunch of monastic translators translating text. She is the one who built uh, the Yongning, and these translators are translating text under her. And of the, of the texts that are translated, there are at least two that are um, very closely related to the question of women in power. So one in which a woman does become the king, <laughs> uh, and one in which the woman is related to this goddess called um, Pure Light, who is also a goddess that Empress Wu associates herself with. So there's a, a confluence of Buddhism, power, and gender here um, that I also think that Empress Wu was looking back at. So I, I see actually her as the model, which makes a little bit more sense in, in Korea and Japan in terms of a chronology to have other women doing this before uh, Empress Wu. Anyways, we won't talk about her too much, but she's an example of another textual producer. Okay, so we have Sungja's dates. What I'm curious about is what is she doing for these 20 years? Well, we don't know anything about her. We know that she's born, we know that she's ordained, and then 20 years later we know that she's an eminent nun. That's all we know about her. My question is, can we place her at that court? Can we place uh, Sungja as one of these early eminent nuns, the earliest nuns in East Asia that we know of, who studied a Buddhist text and who became known as sort of virtuosi Buddhist nuns of their time period, can she be one of these nuns? Now, I think she can. The reason being the, the reference to the Srimala Sutra. It's so early uh, and it's so close to the time of its actual translation that I think that she learned of it in the South because there's no other reference to it in the North. and. Uh, you know, it's possible that she learned of it in other places, but it's also possible that she learned of it in the South. So perhaps we can place her there. Uh, the the Srimala Sutra, I forgot to mention, is also recorded in some historical documents to have been uh, chanted at the court of the Liu Song to audiences of thousands, which is probably hyperbole, but it was related to that court. And so we have in that, in that Liu Song area, we have early nuns who are ordaining each other, because now we've got a group of ten nuns, they can continue on the ordination. They are educating each other, they are reading texts and engaging in textual worlds. And I think that she's one of them. And what I think is really important about placing her there is that outside of this text of biographies we have, the lives of the nuns or the Bichoni Juan, which is a popular text about these, these nuns, outside of that we have no way to verify that any of those stories are, are real. We, you know, that the text itself of the biographies of the nuns is later than the period that it purports to talk about. It's highly edited, it's pretty ideological. So we have no way to verify that any of its contents actually happen. But I think perhaps with this one woman, we might have a way to verify that women were coming from around the empire, which is what we have examples of in Bichu Nijuan, being ordained in the south and then practicing Buddhism. So here I think we have a real life dated example of that from a very early time and we can, we can connect it through the Sutra which I think is pretty remarkable. Okay, so I think we can put her there. Okay, so what am I talking about when I ask the question of whether or not women produced Buddhist texts in medieval China? Let's have a look. So, what I'm not talking about, I should be clear, is I'm not talking about women as authors of text. I'm not talking about women as translators of text. There's absolutely no evidence of that from this time period. I would be surprised and deeply questioning <laughs> if somebody came up with a theory that was suggesting that. Uh, but what I'm talking about is actually the influencing of textual worlds in different, more institutional, more strategic ways. Uh, ways that were open to women, in ways that sort of elite translation and authorship were simply not uh, in this time period. So how can you produce Buddhist texts if you're not an author? or if you're not a translator. First, the first example is you want to become a nun. So you insist, using your power, that this text is translated for you in order for you to become a nun. So there we see women as textual producers. They are forcing the translation of particular texts that will meet their social needs. I think that's one critical way that we can see women as textual producers. Uh, beyond that, and I think in a bigger level, they're influencing more general textual <coughs> translation by being an audience, by just being a critical mass of 
persons interested in Buddhism, wanting to know what the Buddhist texts say, and perhaps wanting something related to their lives as women, which I don't think is a stretch uh, to imagine. Uh, particularly in this time period, there are so many texts that reference this idea of sexual transformation, so many, and there are also so many texts that talk about court women. So I think the two of those questions were sort of hot uh, at the time period in the, say, the mid-fifth century, um, and that they were hot because of their audience. You know, you had an audience of women who were eager to read Buddhist texts, eager to understand and translate and be ordained and pe to be able to show a kind of eminence within the Buddhist tradition that they hadn't had before. Uh, and so I think that's a really important way that they influence textual production, simply influencing which texts are being translated, which are being, uh, creating a canon of a canon, so to speak, um, at that time period. They're also, I think, training their elite. Maybe that's a strange way to talk about it, but I think it's important to, especially in the lives of women, it's important to say things as they are and not back down from big words. It's not simply that they were hanging out and maybe reading some Buddhist texts together. I think that these women were very involved in their sort of Buddhist careers and that they pushed for ordination and that they trained each other how to read these texts, how to chant these texts, uh, and created actually, a, I argue in some, some work, they've created a new form of womanhood that wasn't really available prior to this time, a kind of elite Buddhist womanhood uh, that just simply wasn't there before and that they are participating in. And when they're doing that, of course, they're they are transmitters of text, they are copiers of text, they are people involved in textual production. Also reading, memorizing, chanting, we have many examples of women from this time period being referred to as, as good readers, good chanters of this kind of text. So again, that, that helps to tell us which texts are important and, and a general as an audience. You know, when we, when we think of Buddhist textual production, What's both baffling and fantastic about Buddhism is that we don't have one book, right? We have thousands of books, and we have to find a way to talk about those thousands of books in a way that makes sense within the Buddhist tradition. What we normally do is we talk about the later sectarian traditions. We talk about the big books that have made big influence in the sectarian traditions of Buddhism. Uh, but in this period, different books are popular. And when we start looking at which ones were popular, we can connect them to different audiences. And I think that those, those audiences were female. Okay, so that's what I mean about uh, textual uh, sponsorship or textual production at the court. Okay. So I'm going to spend the last like 10 minutes or 15 minutes just on one slide. <laughs> we're going to try to talk about uh, if this matters. Um, and what are the ways in which it matters? Because um, what I don't want my scholarship to do or what I don't want to be as a scholar is somebody who simply says, oh, women did that. You know, we can look back. That's an easy thing to do. Uh, women did that. Women, women did text. Of course women did text. Why did, why did we not assume they didn't do text, right, in some kind of way? Uh, that's a, kind of a, a first layer of scholarship. That's a first layer, layer of questioning that we get from our data um, and we can talk about. But it's important, I think, for us to think about why it matters for us to point this out. And uh, these are the reasons why I think it matters. So I'll talk about these for about 10 minutes or so. Um, but this is just me starting to think about this. So if there are other people <laughs> who have other suggestions as to why this stuff matters or why do you think it matters for uh, the kinds of study that you do or uh, I'm particularly interested actually because I work in early medieval China I'd be particularly interested in knowing why this matters in Japan or why it matters in Korea uh, or in other places in which you see this happening again. So let's talk about Sangju. I tried to make different levels of, of why this matters. For the nun, Sangju, it matters in a big it matters in this way. Here we are, 1600 years after her death, talking about her. That would not have happened had she not been a Buddhist, had she not been involved in Buddhist textual worlds. Uh, we don't know anything about her birth. We know that she was born just simply in the north. She was born, um, she would have come of age, let's say, at just the precise time in which the Northern Way took the Northern Liang. Uh, a violent, violent transition, not a good time uh, to be kind of young <laughs> at that time. That's all we really know about her early life. It's only once she becomes famous for her relationship to Buddhist text do we see her through history, right? So she becomes famous for doing something that women don't 
are not supposed to have done in this time, which is learn and study and translate, and, or not translate, and chant uh, Buddhist texts. So the very fact that we are still talking about her today matters. It shows that her, her own life uh, had a serious change of course at some point, and that was due to the Buddhist institution, and it was due to her education in the Buddhist institution that allowed her to be a court servant, essentially. And it's also interesting to look at a nun like Sangju and be able to say with quite certainty that of the Northern Way's court servants, the people that served the court of the Northern Way in its, uh, in its time, she's one of the longest. She served the Northern Way court for like 50 years or something like that, just a really, really long time she was there. Uh, not, not quite 50 years, a long time. She died in, in her 70s, and that's, that's an incredible career for a courtier uh, from this time period. So she would have seen a lot, she would have experienced a lot, she would have influenced a lot of things happening in her court. Um, so in that way, this matters for her on that, that basic kind of uh, personal level. Okay, so does it matter for Buddhism? This is the biggest question, I think, or Buddhist studies, maybe I should have uh, put that. Does it matter for, for Buddhist studies and for Buddhism? Uh, I think this kind of study that we're doing matters in a couple different ways uh, for how we study Buddhism. First off, when we often, not always, but often when we talk about the history of East Asian forms of Buddhism, what we are talking about is not this formative period. We're often not talking about, say, the third through sixth centuries. We're often talking about uh, the mid Tang and beyond. And that's because of the sectarian tradition, right? The power of the sectarian traditions. The sectarian traditions are still practiced today in many parts of the world, and they're interested in their own histories. And so that's often, we see history sort of backwards uh, from what we still have today, uh, which stops ahead of this period, even though this period is very foundational. So when we do this kind of history, it, it tells us a few things, that there's more Buddhism <laughs> than that, uh, and that there has been a transition in the way in which text has been produced within Buddhism that we don't pay enough attention to. So in this early period from the 4th to 6th centuries, the, the textual project is translation, cataloging, understanding what kind of textual products are out there, putting them together in some kind of way, um, a, a scholar of Chinese religion, Michelle Strickman, has referred to this period as China's Gnostic period because there's just text being made everywhere of all different stripes and all different varieties. So this early period is really this impetus to understand and catalog and organize text. And it's only in the later period uh, that, it's in the later period, in the sectarian period, where we start to see a transition where you don't need the court anymore patronizing translators. The role of the court greatly diminishes uh, beyond the tongue, and what you get is Buddhist groups making their own new forms of literature. So poetry and rules and commentaries and all of those kinds of things that become very, very important, but importantly, are not open to women. Women are not involved in those early sectarian traditions in the way that they are involved in the court. Right? So the, the courts of this time period, there were tons of women <laughs> literally living at the court because emperors had lots of wives and emperors lived short lives. So there were, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so the women are piling up, right? Um, and also in, the, in the, this time of violent transition, the 4th to 6th centuries, women are often taken in as slaves. So if I'm going to conquer another group, the men might be killed, but the women might be taken in as slaves to the court. So there's lots of women at court, and they are in some places sharing the same space with Buddhist monastic women and in uh, somewhat frequent contact with monastic men as well. So there's just kind of like permeable boundary between court and Buddhism in the 4th to 6th centuries in which I see women as textual producers. And that disappears in the later tradition when text is mostly created in-house and for particular reasons. And no, there are no women in the great sectarian traditions. No women early patriarchs, right? Uh, so their role diminishes as textual production changes let's say. So that's one of the reasons that I think this kind of study is so important uh, to show us that what actually has happened to the East Asian Buddhist tradition throughout time and the ways in which differing peoples in society have been able to relate to that tradition. And again, coming out of medieval China, I think it's very important for Japan and for Korea for us to be able to make these kinds of arguments and look at how the Buddhism outside of the Chinese mainland has, has been shaped out of this period. So that's why I think it matters in one level to, to Buddhism. Anyways, now for women's history, 
Um, when I, I've given this, these, I haven't given this presentation, but I've talked a bit about uh, some of these women in other presentations. And some of the questions that I get, or the two questions that I most often get, are, do you actually think women could read <laughs> in this time period? Uh, and do you actually think women could move around uh, in this time period? Um, my answer is yes on both fronts, um, with, you know, some kind of conditions. I, I do think that this study forces us to revisit those narratives of women in prehistoric, or not prehistoric times, women in historic times. <laughs> I'm not talking that early. Um, women in historic times, we, we, there's this large tendency to think uh, that women had little agency and that women were not involved in things like reading and writing and learning and traveling and the kinds of things that um, we don't see in historical sources easily that they did because historical sources again of course have been written uh, by not these women uh, but that they probably did I mean when we look at just simply Sungja's inscription and we look at the the sort of interest in monasticism for these women it's it would be silly to question whether they could read there's no reason to question whether they could read they it says they can read <laughs> it appears that they could read it appears that uh, they were doing political things that are predicated on them being able to read uh, so that question to me is um, is a pretty obvious one I think that to some extent anyways as much as literacy is always a kind of a shifting and difficult thing to map these women were reading on the other hand the one that's more difficult maybe is the ability of women to move around so that that's a more that's a bigger issue and that's the biggest issue, I think, in the biography of Sungju when I, try, when I say that she went to the south. So could she move north to south? Is that something she could have done? I have uh, thought about it a lot, <laughs> and I've read through a lot of sources, um, and I have seen other examples of the mobility of women um, coming from the south to the north in some cases, um, and moving between different places in the north and different places in the south, uh, where it looks like they were moving somewhat independently. So at this point, I don't have reason to think that she couldn't. I don't have proof to say that she did, other than putting her in that audience of the Srimala Sutra. Um, but I don't think that there's enough reason to, to believe that she couldn't, actually, when we look at this. Uh, and there are, there are say, uh, routes of, of transmission and travel that Buddhists were certainly using. Male Buddhist monastics were certainly coming in from the northern Liang and down to the, the southern courts. So why couldn't a nun of this time? I think that perhaps she did. Uh, and I think that those questions are, are important to revisit. The fact that maybe women did have more agency, more social mobility, more social fluidity uh, than we think about in that time period. Anyway, we certainly know that she moved from the northern west, northern Liang territory over to the court. We certainly know that. So if she did that, why couldn't she have also gone south? Is, I think, a question that we need to ask uh, from this study. Uh, and, large, and finally, I'm going to wrap up for thinking why I think this, this whole thing matters on a history of religions perspective. All of my degrees are from history of religions. I'm very much a religious studies kind of person. And so I always try to think about how that matters. For me, and I, again, I'd be happy to hear other reasons why people think this might matter. For me, I think methodologically, when we study religion, uh, we, we often don't think about institution as much as we should. We often think more about practice or ritual or belief. Um, and in this case, I think it really brings the institution of religion into just sharp relief because we see that as an institution, Buddhism affected the lives of women in very concrete ways that we can look at and we can point to. And in some ways, it bettered their situations, right? And again, often when we think, and maybe this is just like a modern Western hangover, often when we think of religious institution, we think of how unfair it has been to women. And, and historically, and I don't want to suggest otherwise, <laughs> I don't want to say, you know, religious institutions are great for women. Uh, but in this particular case, I think that the religious institution, when, when looked at, when you look at Buddhism as an institution, you can see very clearly the ways in which it gave women social opportunities. It allowed them to, say, be public women of standing in society without having children. It allowed them to be educated. Perhaps in the case of Sangja, it did allow for her mobility. If she was a nun traveling with other nuns from north to south, uh, then that allowed her that movement, right? 
And so I think that uh, it, by, by a study like this, we can again appreciate the fact that religious institutions are deeply important to the ways in which religion spreads, and it's not just about text, and it's not just about ideas. It's very much about, on the ground, what people did with their bodies and how they related to those big centers of power. So those are the ways in which I think the whole thing matters. Um, but I would love to hear from you. So I think I will stop talking. If you have questions, I'd love to hear them.